a wonderful portrait of the natural world and the sea. I'm Roger and this is a book shook and today's podcast is all about the first half of June's book, The Offing by Benjamin Myers, published in 2019. So the idea of the podcast is that we'll spend a month reading a book, hopefully together. I'll split the book in two equal halves. On the second Friday of the month, I'll share my thoughts and yours on the first half of the book, maybe make a few predictions. And when we finish reading the book, I'll publish part two of the podcast in a similar vein. That'll be on the last Friday of the month. We'll decide whether it's a book we'd recommend to a friend or not. Of course, you don't have to read anything at all. If you're into Audible, then you can listen to the book or you can do neither, of course, and just join me for the ride. I'll be summarising what happens in the book, just for you, but be aware there may be spoilers. You can leave a comment or start a conversation at the Bookshook YouTube channel or send an email to bookshook at yahoo.com. Welcome to Bookshook. So, I've read up to the end of chapter 6, that's page 132, which is just over halfway. We start off with an old man reminiscing that he's going to tell a story. Quote, I knew not what language could do then. I did not yet understand the power and potency of words. The complex magic of language was as alien as the altered country that I saw around me during that summer. Something insidious grows within me now. Its roots are deeply anchored. Vines reach around corners to clutch and tighten. I am a passive host, too tired to fight. I accept it and instead sit back and merely wonder where life went and await. My desk is old and the chair creaks. Twice I have had the joints fixed and the upholstery replaced. Every so often the old wood-burning stove coughs smoke back into the room and the guttering is clogged with moss. One window is cracked and soon I will need to find someone to fix the roof. The whole place needs a lot of work, but I am too ancient for all that now. The building and its contents will outlast me. The old word processor still functions though. There's power in the both of us. There is electricity and while it is still there I have something to share. So he starts telling his story about him as a boy. The war has just ended. Quote, I was 16 and free and hungry, hungry for food, as we all were. The shortage continued for many years, yet my appetite was for more than the merely edible. To those blessed with the gift of living, it seemed as if the present moment was a precious empty vessel waiting to be filled with experience. And there's quite a few cliches already. For example, I felt as if I wandered into a painting. And I think I mentioned that at the end of last podcast. He certainly likes nature. And he's a northerner. And he likes thinking about nature in the north. Quote, More than anything, though, was the allure of a natural world in which I intended to immerse myself. I knew from books that the north offered a diverse terrain of wolds and woods, moors and fells, dales and valleys, all inhabited by plant and animal species waiting to be seen by my wide and wandering eye. He then talks of where he sleeps and how he eats. Quote, I headed south, logging and lambing, droving and driving, chopping and chipping. Wow, look at all that alliteration also has something quite interesting called polysynton, when you've got all those ands in a row. He doesn't like the idea of working in a pit, that's for certain, and he talks about it quite a lot. And the war is a constant presence in his life, and this is just after the Second World War. Quote, During these dialogues with strangers, the war was barely mentioned. That beast stayed buried. It did not bear exhumation. I wish I could read these dialogues. So far, I have not read a single dialogue tag. But that does change. My views on the book do change. These initial views, I'm going to have to put them to rest because I do think it improves. He heads for the sea, Whitby, and finds some down plains. Quote, It felt as if the bomber had only come down minutes earlier in a spiralling descent over the irregular checkerboard fields of a foreign land, smoke trailing, death rising up to greet its hurriedly praying pilot, one more victim in the mad folly dance of conflict, another ghosted statistic. He continues his travels again, and then we've got this funny cow simile. Quote, I passed herds of cows with udders dangling like party balloons from last Christmas. I love that image of cows (laughs) with their udders looking like party balloons. The sea here is almost mirage-like rather than industrial from his childhood memories quote my first impression of the sea had not been of the water itself but that which fed off it and into it a world of rivets and sparks of fire and noise and great gray monstrous structures like steel cathedrals stripped down and tipped sideways hulking half-finished warships whose brute dimensions were almost beyond comprehension i'm beginning to get used to this wordy style 
it did feel like I was reading a thesaurus, but it definitely is improving. As I read, I'm liking the book more and more. I was very sceptical at the start, and you could probably tell at the end of last podcast, I was a bit sceptical of the writing, but it definitely is a grower. Anyway, he sees a badger set, and then he walks down a lane, sees a cottage, and encounters a dog. And its owner is an older lady called Dulcie. And she invites him to tea. And he does say that this meeting changes his life. Quote, This was to become one of those moments when life presents a new path whose importance may only be fully understood in years to come. She prepares a nettle tea for him, and he helps her using some gloves. Quote, I slipped on the gloves and felt a clammy warmth from this odd old lady's palms that reminded me of cricket games on the wreck back at home and the one shared pair of batsman's gloves passed from boy to boy until they were nothing but threadbare shells of stale sweat and tattered rubber. There's Proust's Madeline again, these gloves sending him down memory lane. They have tea and she says that folk down at the bay can be strange. She also says that she's not religious. Buck and fugger to that, she says. And, quote, Butler doesn't much care for religion either. He bit the last vicar that tried to pat him. They said he should be put down, but just let them try. First little bit of humour and we get more and more humour with Dulcing. The prose is really starting to move in a more natural, less overworked way. Dulcie says, where are you going? And Robert, we learn his name, says he's going to the sea. And then we have this section where she talks a little bit like him. Quote, The tide will ebb and the tide will flow. The bladder rack will rise and reach for the saffron stain of the sun. I feel like the narrator is kind of maybe mixing Dulcie a little bit with his own voice. They discuss war. Robert says, quote, It's those Germans. I'd like to give them what for. Dulcie says, would you? And he says, yes, they should all rot for what they've done. You should see some of the men in the village, and that's just the ones who made it back. I'd slit the throat of any kraut me. It would be my duty as an Englishman. Darcy studied me for a moment. I can understand your hatred completely, she said, and your spirited boy's own bravado is to be applauded. But, Robert, you should not be bitter or angry about it. War is war. It started by the few and fought by the many, and everyone loses in the end. And this is right at the beginning, who says exactly the same thing as Dulcie. Quote, For no one ever really wins a war, some just lose a little less than others. Is that a coincidence? Is it just the mind of the narrator conflating his ideas with this long-ago-remembered character? And then we have a really interesting quote. I had grown from a boy to a young man knowing few certainties in life, that the Germans were surely a monstrous breed, was one of them. I failed to see how they could possibly be like us. Now, I'm just thinking, is this Robert's character arc? Is he going to go from hating the Germans to an understanding of them? Is this what the novel ultimately is going to be about? I don't know. I mean, in some ways, I hope not. I, I want more than, than that. Dulcie also has the same propensity towards alliteration. She says, quote, there's no glory in bloodshed and bullet holes. She says that the English and the Germans are the same, and more on that theme later. We learn that Dulcie lives alone. Dulcie says to Robert, go and fetch me some garlic for supper. And so he does. He goes hunting for garlic, and he feels at one with nature. Quote, Becoming a part of it, immersed in such a way that I could hear the rustle of every calling ant or the scratching of each fly's dry wing or the chewing of a masticating wasp on a rotten piece of timber hidden from view. Breathing deeply, I smelled the sod, the garlic, herbs and airborne pollen and the tang of the salted sea air too. A meal of the senses, the tiniest details came into sharp focus, the skeletal architecture of a small dead leaf that had lain untouched since winter or the quiver of a solitary blade of wild grass where others beside it were still. He finally reaches the sea and when he heads back he discovers an old wooden shack in Dulcie's back garden full of bits and bobs. And he comes back and sees Dulcie's kitchen, and it's described beautifully. Quote, a veil of steam billowing up from the pot that was noisily roiling away. She pushed the window open wider. Come in and look at these beautiful beasts, she said. I walked around to the side door and stepped into the kitchen. It was small, like the galley of a ship with pots and pans and utensils hanging everywhere from the hooks, and was dominated by an old scorched range that featured several circular hot plates, a main oven and two side ovens. It seemed like something from another age, a roaring fire pit emitting more heat than the warm day needed. 
All around there were unlit candles placed on saucers and in old sardine tins, and from the ceiling hung a paraffin lamp on which Dulcie, a good three inches taller than me, almost certainly must have hit her head with regularity. So she's cooking this lobster, and as Dulcie cooks, Robert goes to the pantry, and there's absolutely loads of food. So I'm thinking, maybe she's some kind of pirate, or she's a black marketeer, and she's managed to get all these amazing ingredients through some German supplier, or through some spying that she's done in the war. There's some lovely turns of phrase from Dulcie. Quote, she nodded out across the back garden to where I noticed for the first time a sawhorse and chopping block. It keeps me trimble, she said, trim and nimble. They always say logs warm you up three times, chopping them, carrying them and burning them. And they choose a wine and then they dig into the lobster. And this has got to be the best lobster eating scene I have ever read. And I feel so hungry for reading it. Robert then plays his Jew's harp for Dulcie and Dulcie tells the tale of how Scarborough got its name. There were some Vikings who went out in search of adventure to travel, like you, Robert, she says, quote. And then they talk about travel. And Dulcie says, quote, travel is a search for the self, trust me, and sometimes just to search is enough. Robert says, do you think so? And Dulcie says, of course, wander around long enough with your eyes open and soon enough you'll find things. Great journeys are never about the destination. Yes, says Robert. I mean, this morning I didn't imagine I'd taste lobster, lemon or wine by evening. Exactly, exactly. That's precisely what I'm talking about, says Dulcie. Open eyes, experience. Then he sleeps in a tent in her back garden and contemplates nature and what it must feel like to be at sea. When he wakes up in the morning, we hear him say, quote, I woke to a different symphony. What a poet. Butters, Dulcie's dog, summons Robert to breakfast. And they don't talk a huge amount at breakfast. Quote, you don't say much and I like that. There is poetry in silence, but most don't stop to hear it. This is Dulcie talking. They just talk, 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 but say nothing because they're afraid of hearing their own heartbeat, afraid of their own mortality. Robert mentions the shed and she is taciturn. Now, does the shed represent a lost love, maybe a husband lost in the war? Robert offers to help with weeding and gets to work. And when he goes in to ask for oil for shears, he stumbles across a huge country dresser. Quote, I saw through into the small sitting room that was dominated by a huge country dresser packed with a full dinner service on display. There was a fireplace and a chair too, and stacked everywhere there were piles of books and papers and two or three empty wine bottles. Above the far on the mantelpiece, there was a photograph of a young woman, Dulcie perhaps. Another showed two women, but they were too far away for their features to be distinguishable, and I didn't want to pry. Now I'm thinking, I wonder if she used to own a country estate, a full dinner service in a small cottage. I'm assuming it's a small cottage. It seems out of place. Continuing the narrative, Darcy plays a Noel Coward song and says that Noel Coward was a friend of mine. The song is called Don't Let's Be Beastly to the Germans. And I actually listened to the tune on Spotify and it's quite interesting. She has a hatred of the sea. Quote, and this is Robert talking. I thought I'd just finish the fence line and then quickly trim back some of the scrub down at the bottom so that you can see the sea again. And Dulcie says, I don't need to see it to believe it. Robert says, but don't you want to enjoy the full view? She frowned. Not especially. I have no great love for the sea these days. Let's just say we had a falling out and leave it at that. So if she did have a husband, was her husband killed in the Navy perhaps? Robert takes Butters the dog for a walk and then he carries on working and has a bit of a snooze. And then he goes back to the house for fish and chips. Dulcie and he have a little chat. She says that she's concerned there will be another war. He says that he's 16 and she says that's so young. Robert doesn't want to work six days a week in the pit like his father. Dulcie describes the horse in the square where Robert lives and the tale of the sculptor Raphael Monte and it's a good metaphor for the war and I'll talk about that later. Dulcie is concerned for young Robert's future. She says have you considered university? So this is really the second big question of the novel. Will Robert escape his destiny that is set in coal and become educated? I think because he's writing such a detailed and wordy account that he, he does end up at university or become educated. But he does say, folk like me don't go to university. 
she asks him, have you read any books? And he says, I like the 39 steps. And she says, oh, I knew Buchan, the author. He also says that he didn't particularly enjoy Romeo and Juliet. And Dulcie reacts with some derision. Quote, that's not poetry, she said. That's archaic drama written to be performed on theatre stages, not read aloud in stuffy classrooms, presented incorrectly and out of context. It will put you off for life. But a good poem shucks the oyster shell of one's mind to reveal the pearl within. It gives words to those feelings whose definitions are forever beyond the reach of verbal articulation. Bill Shakey has his moments. Robert says, the bits they made us read were boring. It made no sense to me. It was like a foreign language. And Dulcie says, then they were making you read the wrong ones. The wrong ones, I say, and that's nothing short of a tragedy in itself. What you need is poetry you can relate to. Everything you've ever felt has been experienced by another human being before you. You may not think so, but it's true. That is what poetry is. It exists to remind us of this very fact. Poetry is mankind's way of saying that we are not entirely alone in the world. It offers a voice of comfort to resonate down through the ages, like a lone foghorn's mournful call in the nautical light. Poetry is a stepladder between the centuries, from ancient Greece to tomorrow afternoon. She also says you must read D.H. Lawrence. Quote, the animal within and the world without, that is what he writes about best. She drops a load of her books onto the kitchen table for him to take away. She says she knew Lawrence in New Mexico, and she says, let Lawrence be an inspiration. Quote, we must fight to make the world a more livable, colourful and exciting place. Lord knows it's needed now more than ever. No one starts wars when they are fulfilled. That much is certain, and the pursuit of personal freedom can now be viewed as a radical act. And that is my point, Robert. You must live your life exactly how you wish to, not for anyone else. We are on the cusp of great changes, trust me. All innocence is gone, so now what? Freedom and the pursuit of it. That's what we must strive for at all times. The future may be uncertain, but it is yours for the taking. Something good has to come out of all this senseless violence. Let poetry and music and wine and romance guide the way. Let liberty prevail. So she gives him some books. Quote, Take them, said Dulcie. It's good to have a purgation. It's not the books that really matter. Books are just paper, but they contain within them revolutions. You'll find that most dictators barely read beyond their own grubby hagiographies. That's where they're going wrong. Not enough poetry in their lives. And then Dulcie describes what the offing is. Quote, it was a close evening and the sky was starting to moil. Clouds clustered and tumbled, eating themselves. The warmth of earlier had grown into a damp, cloying heat, and there was a tightening of the air that matched a dull pain down one side of my neck that was threatening to spread into a headache. I stood and stepped up onto my chair to get a better view of the sea, where a foreshadowing curtain was being drawn across the water. Between the low, scudding rain clouds and the sea, there was a mottled movement, a shifting shape like a swarm of insects, but which was in fact columns of seaborne rain coalescing and then separating again as they blew in on the cooler winds of the northern continent. It was as if the sea itself were being sucked up skywards. The rain was many miles out, yet here in the garden it had fallen suddenly still and noticeably silent. No birds were calling, no distant dog parked. The muscle in my neck throbbed with an almost electric pulse. They call it the offing, said Dulcie quietly. He camps in the shack because it's raining so violently. And then we have this wonderful evocation of nature as he wakes up. Quote, The sun rose lazily over the meadow, pale and wan at first, but then gaining in strength and luminescent power, and as it began to blaze a golden morning across the streaming meadow, a deer appeared in the overgrown edges to sniff the warming air. It took several steps forward on legs that looked impossibly thin, stood for a few moments, during which I dared not move, even at some distance away in the shack. Evidently, it heard something imperceptible, for it turned tail and ran into the trees, but I stayed unmoving, my unwashed face reflected in the mottled glass. A fog of flying insects gathered as bees and wasps and moths and butterflies and dragonflies took flight. I carried my sleeping bag outside and shook away the dust of decades." Poor Robert gets stung by some hogsweed and Dulcie treats it. She gives him a German sausage for his onward journey. She says, quote, I thought it might change your mind about our Teutonic cousins. So I'm thinking, where did she get that German sausage? I'm repeating Robert's words because she, he asked the same question. As he's walking away, Robert muses on Dulcie's fresh attitude to him. 
He's never been treated like this before in his life. Quote, Darcy had seen me in a way entirely unprejudiced by familiarity, history or expectation. That is, she had taken me as she found me, and not only that, but had seen fit to treat me as someone worth bothering with. Not quite an equal, for it was clear that she was a wise, worldly and original person, and I was none of these. Yet in our brief time together, I had begun to feel as if I was becoming someone else. I was approaching being myself rather than the person I had been living as. Dulcie had seen me as I was and not been bored or uninterested. I'm thinking he's got to go back to Dulcie. She's good for him. But I know she also wants to set him free. Continuing the narrative, Robert walked through the seaside town, reveling in the briny sights and smells of the sea. And he goes swimming and he loves the sea. Have a listen to this description. Quote, I looked out across the water as it rose in gentle berms and then curled and broke in waves of hissing white spume, shifting the shale beneath in a hypnotic percussive rattle of stone on stone. I think these descriptions are just wonderful. As you can probably tell, I am really growing to love the way that this book has been written. I was not sure in the first few pages, but now I am beginning to love it. He meets the fisherman Barton. And Barton says, look, please take these fish to Dulcie. And finally, he concedes. So it looks like he will be going back to see Dulcie. Robert says to the fisherman Barton, did she get married? And Barton says, you'll have to ask her yourself. And so he returns with the catch and Dulcie reacts badly to him swimming in the sea. She says, it's prone to cruelty. Trust me. That's her quote. So there's that fear of the sea again. What has happened? She's obviously loved someone who has been hurt by the sea. She agrees to feed him, and he says, quote, I was back again. She lets him stay in the shack, and in return he agrees to fix it up. And Dulcie says that it used to be an artist studio. Perhaps her dead husband, in my imagination, was an artist. Interestingly, she's quite resistant to him doing up the shack. She says, quote, let the meadow swallow it up, but he does insist, and she lets him. She mentions that his feet stink, but she doesn't offer him <laughs> the use of her shower or bath, which I think is quite interesting. He has to go down to a, a lake or a pool and clean himself. As he's clearing out the shack, he discovers a bound manuscript with the title The Offing by a certain Romy Landau. Now, Landau to me sounds like a German surname. Is this manuscript by Dulcie's lover? He also finds a strange hanging mobile. And when he goes to get supplies for repairing the shack, the shopkeeper says, quote, A bit of company will be nice for her. It must be lonely up on that hillside after everything she's been through. So Robert says, She has her dog. And the shopkeeper shakes her head. Scant consolation, terrible, terrible business. So something has happened. She also talks of Miss Piper. That's Miss Piper's business, she says. So we know that she's not married. As he's going back to Dulcie's, he goes via a churchyard and inside he notices a young lady holding the folded cap of a soldier. And he also discovers these strange mobiles hanging in the church that he discovered in the shack. So there we have it, the end of the first part. And there's so many questions that I want to ask about this. So the first is, what is Dulcie hiding? The shed upset her. She knows Lawrence, she knows Noel Coward, her father knew Buchan, so she has something in her family history, she knows a lot of people. And what is her link with Germany? She got hold of that German sausage and she is sympathetic. And then we've got the strange hanging mobile. Is that some symbol of the dead soldiers perhaps? And who was the, quote, not old lady in the church? Then will Robert end up going to university? Will he escape the pit life? I'm pretty certain that that's going to happen but how he will do it that's an interesting question that hopefully will be answered in the second part of the book i want to discuss a few ideas that really cropped up in the book the first is nature and the poetic descriptions of nature are all the way throughout this first half he's quite taxonomical sometimes in the way he describes nature have a listen to this quote 
I followed the sight line to where she was pointing and carefully picked my way down through the meadow. It was deep with weeds. Within 20 paces in any direction, I counted balsam, rackwort, nipplewort, knotweed, bindweed, chickweed, aster, nettles, brambles, burdock, cleavers, thistles of various sizes, some sprouting to shin height. I recognised other plants too, sedge, valerian, foxglove and harebells, as well as the usual abundance of dandelions and all manner of wildflowers such as oxeye daisy, flax and roseroot. It was remarkable how many different species had made their way to the wild meadow and all vying for the same small patch of sky. And then in Dolce's pantry, he says, quote, I saw apples, carrots, potatoes, kale, celery, spring onions. Also, war is a constant theme throughout the first half. The futility of war, the fact that there are no winners and that we must be sympathetic with our enemy, in this case, the Germans. Dulce also makes a point that it's very much a male-driven idea, the idea of war. We also have an interesting metaphor with Monty's horse on the power of population. It really shows how wars are started, the blind leading the blind. In this case, blind man leading blind Monty. It's nothing to do with what is actually needed in the physical world. For example, the tongue is there, the horse is fine. The story articulates the will of the masses who want war. And then also we have that section with Douglas Bader. People wanted a hero. They created a hero. We also have the idea that people are all the same. For example, the Germans and the English. Dalsy says, quote, It's only water that divides us, and even that came later on. Once you could have walked from here all the way to Bremen or Leipzig or Hanover, or wherever your feet happened to take you, Doggerland, they called it. One day the salty water simply washed over the last strip of land to sluice away the soil, and voila, a new island was created. Think about that for a moment. Once England was Germany, and vice versa. We also have the idea of class. Robert has never tasted wine. His father is a pit worker. And Dulcie is a much higher class than Robert. She knows how to eat lobster. She's also confident, mocking religion and swearing, whereas Robert is not really confident in in those ways. For example, Dulcie says, quote, your ablutions. He really doesn't understand the word. We also got some funny bodily function metaphors all the way through the book. For example, quote, no longer muscular of mind. And then we've got a quote, I was hungry, my appetite was for more than the merely edible. And some slightly interesting word substitutions. For example, woolly-backed creatures instead of saying sheep. And we have these very interesting words like gelid um, instead of saying frozen. And I've already mentioned that we've got quite a few cliches. Well-oiled machine, pit of my stomach, spring in my stride. What interesting ideas did the book raise for you? I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd like now to share some of your thoughts and comments on last month's book, Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami. There are some really interesting thoughts on Goodreads and I received some very interesting emails as well. Yulia wrote... Quote, what can I say? There's too little of the characters that do spark my interest and much too much of the depressive girlfriend and her kooky friend at the mental institution. Also, the scenes which were supposed to be funny about his college roommate didn't interest me at all and ultimately struck me as dark and disturbing. Nandaki Shaw wrote, quote, I have been trying to do a traditional review of this book for quite some time now, but have been finding it impossible, so I'll give you my impressions of reading the book. Reading Norwegian Wood, for me, is like sitting on the porch at twilight during a rare break in the rains during the monsoon, watching the golden rays of the dying sun light up the rain-drenched earth and filling your lungs with the smell of the rain. Reading Norwegian Wood is like waking up on a winter morning, opening the window and getting hit in the face by an invigorating blast of icy east wind. Reading Norwegian Wood is like staying up late, listening to the harmonious cacophony of drums our local temple festival, inhaling the aroma of the burning lamp, wicks and incense. Kenny, a Goodreads user, said, In the end, Norwegian Wood is a book which you can't help but loving. Murakami wins the reader over with abundant charm, echoes of youth and a story we can all relate to. Ian Marvin Gray wrote, The overwhelming feeling of reading Norwegian Wood is one of being in a blank, dreamlike, ethereal world. Hello, Murakami describes people, surroundings and objects with precision. It all seems otherworldly, as if everybody lives and breathes in a world beyond this world. There is a sense that at any moment it could all disappear, that it might all just be part of some cosmic vanishing act. Even if we make it through, we might turn around and discover that some of our friends haven't been so lucky. 
Thanks very much for listening. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. Email bookshook at yahoo.com or leave a comment at the Bookshook YouTube channel. I'd also love suggestions for future books to read together. Maybe there's been one sitting on your shelf for ages which you haven't got around to reading and you just need that push to get started. Talking of next books, after I publish part two of the offing in two weeks, that's the 25th of June, July's podcast will be all about Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro. So get that one at the ready if you can. Anyway, I look forward to discussing the final part of the offing in two weeks. See you then. Thank you.